the antidote. 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 You're listening to the antidote with Dave Hawkins. With Christian music that doesn't suck. This is The Antidote with Dave Hawkins. We opened with an incredibly short song with an incredibly short name, 5.4. Clank is the name of the band and the name of tonight's guest. The band has been splicing the mosh pit and the dance floor with an industrial vibe since 1996. Even though there's been some fairly long gaps between releases, Clank has never put out anything that was second rate and it's certainly been worth the wait for Clank's latest and perhaps greatest release, Rise. It was a huge treat for me to have a chance to speak with Clank for a detailed talk about the band's sound, their struggles and triumphs, what Clank likes and dislikes in the music scene, and of course, their new album. Enjoy our talk and the music of Clank. Darren Dialosa that name may be unrecognizable, but if I introduce our guest as Clank, we all know who's here. Clank, good to have you on The Antidote. Thank you for having me today. I've got to tell you that I'm a long-term fan of the music of Clank. I bought my copy of your first CD, Still Suffering, when it came out in 96. How does it feel for you to still be creating new music two decades later? (laughs) I'm starting to feel old. (laughs) (laughs) Don't we all? Yeah, it's actually pretty cool, though, because um, luckily um, we get a lot of letters still from people and messages now with the joy of social media um, about people saying that, you know, our music was like the soundtrack to their adolescence and stuff (laughs) like, you know, so which is it's awesome. And it's also kind of weird at the same time because it's like, man, you're making me feel old, you know, like, (laughs) (laughs) you know, because I was like, like we said, 1996 when it came out in November. And here we are all these years later. Like I started originally in in 1993, December of 93 is when I wrote the very first Clank song, Animosity. So now it's like, I'm really, really feeling old. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before Clank, you were with Circle of Dust. That's when I actually first heard about you. They were also doing the industrial. Has that style always been your passion? Yes. When I was with um, Circle of Dust, it was... um, that was really like my first introduction to like the electronic industrial aspect. You know, I was good friends with, with the guy who was uh, the singer on the band, and he was turning me on to all these cool bands like Ministry and Nine Inch Nails. And I was just drawn in because I was like, man, there's these heavy guitars and these super dancey electronic beats. It was like, you know, like this weird mix, like this shouldn't work, but. It does. And it was like, for me, going down the rabbit hole, you know, it was like, I want more, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, because the, the, the more electronic and crazy you could get and then mixing with the guitars and stuff, it was, it just seemed like endless possibilities, you know, like you can make something that's super heavy. You can make something that's super slow and brooding and just have a nice foreground of like keyboards and audio samples and noises and blips and it was just fascinating to me you know and i i was really drawn into it and like you said here we are all these years later and i'm still making music (laughs) clank came into the industrial metal scene right at its peak and that must have been brutal for you here it is a new band trying to get recognition in the middle of a hot music scene Yeah, it was cool, though, because Circle of Dust was a a good springboard for me because uh, I was still with Circle of Dust when the concept of Clank first came out because I originally wanted to do something more like death metal-y electronic, you know? But then 
I was like, you know what? I just don't want to be pigeonholed with just being one specific super heavy genre. I wanted to have like the death metal aspects, the heaviness, and also like the melodic vocals. You know, I didn't want to just be stuck in one thing. And there was so many bands booming back then. Like I said, Ministry, Nine Inch Nails, and you had bands like God Lives Underwater and Stabbing Westward and... It was a great time for music, especially electronic-based music. You know, there was so many killer releases that came out. And it was pretty cool to be, you know, in with those bands. You know, like, yeah, we had to, did have a little fight a little bit for our own recognition. But, you know, we did a lot of heavy touring for, like, months at a clip. And we were very well received. And like I said, it kind of had a built-in audience from uh, Circle of Dust. So it was a good catalyst for me to launch the Clank stuff. Well, really, even in those days, I don't think anyone was ever going to mix up Clank with Ramstein or Nine Inch Nails because you were putting out a very different sound. Yeah, but you know what? A lot of people, though, they still didn't really know what to classify it. Like some towns we came to and they were like, oh, you know, if you like Nine Inch Nails, you should come see Clank tonight. And, you know, I get it because, you know, we did definitely draw from influences, but we also did our best to remain genuine you know you might be able to hear a little fear factory here and there or some prong or something but at the end of the day we had our own style so a lot of people just they just filed us under that well if you like rob zombie nine inch nails and ministry you'll like these guys which you know it, it worked for us but it was cool that you know all these years later to kind of carve our own niche you know anytime i talk to people they're like you know you guys have all the elements of of this and this and this but you really don't sound like any one band and to me and to you know pat and eric the other guys it's definitely uh a compliment to us because you know it's good to draw from your influences but you don't necessarily want to sound like a carbon copy of somebody exactly and i think that's what drew me into your music back in the mid 90s you signed with Tooth & Nail Records for your original Clank release, Still Suffering. Okay, so Tooth & Nail, I mean, obviously, that pushes you into the realm of Christian music. But a yes. lot of their artists weren't really very comfortable with taking on that label. And I heard that you also had problems with that. Well, because our music was different. Like, basically, our music dealt with real-life themes. You know, I, I write all the lyrics, so and it was about life, how I saw it, how I felt it, how it affected those around me. And, you know, I was going through some pretty heavy stuff at the time, so I was tackling subjects like, you know, alienation, um, suicide, questioning God and his existence. Some people were super stoked on it, but other people were very hesitant, especially in, in the Christian market. When a deal was offered to me, it was like, hey, you know what? I'm a musician. Um, somebody's offering me a chance to make music, and, and they're willing to pay for it, to put it out. You know, I'm going to go for it. And, you know, it kind of bit us in the butt a little bit in the beginning. It's weird now because it's way more acceptable to be in a Christian band now than it was like 20 plus years ago. Because there were people like that were very like, oh, I don't want to hear about God even if you necessarily weren't being preachy. So it was definitely different, but, you know, it was cool to be on a label like Tooth & Nail was exploding. It was blowing up all these other bands they had. It was mostly punk, ska, and hardcore. It was cool for us because we didn't really sound like anybody else on the label either. So they did put it in Christian bookstores, and they put it in regular stores. And it was funny because the owner of the label would be like, hey, we got a bunch of returns. People said that the artwork was too dark. I'm like, really? And they said, yeah, it wasn't bright enough. They thought it was just too dark or there was no positivity. I'm like, really? I'm like, all the songs are positive. I'm like, you know, it might be wrapped up in a, um, a heavy package. You know, I don't know. I, <laughs> I always saw things differently in that respect because I grew up in a stereotypical, point again, Christian household where you couldn't listen to anything unless it was Christian. So I was like... I'd have like, you know, my Striper albums and my whatever, Sandy Patty albums or whatever. And I would be sneaking in Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin that my cousin would lend me. You know, I'd stick <laughs> it in the album sleeve and I'd listen to it on headphones because I did not dare let my parents hear. <laughs> As you heard, Still Suffering was my introduction to The Sound of Clank, a superb album that in 96 stood above the rest of the music scene. And it still does. My favorite from Still Suffering has had a lot of plays on my computer, and now you get to hear it. This is Fall.
there was a faith aspect on the Still Suffering release. You know, I'm thinking of songs like Wooden Soul and Burning. I suppose the message, you know, was sort of veiled. You just didn't want to push your point? Yeah, but same as I said, Burning was like kind of questioning God. It was like, I know you exist, but where are you? Especially for myself, I was questioning things back at that time. And I've always liked to do things that have like a surface meaning, but then there could be like double entendres, you know, like on the surface, it might seem like one thing, but if you dig a little deeper, you know, you might get a little more out of it. It was great because people would be like, oh, this song on here to me, uh, it's totally about this. I know you wrote the song exactly 100% about this. I was hesitant to tell people originally what my meaning of every single song was only because I didn't want to taint or ruin anyone else's interpretation or meaning they got out of it. But that's the joy of music. It's open to interpretation. And a lot of people get the music and some people didn't. I mean, there was a lot of people that just, you know, I don't get this whole heavy music with danciness and how can you throw a dash of spirituality or, or Christianity in there? They're like, you know, like they just couldn't comprehend it. And I was like, you know what? It's all good. You know, I mean, not every band is for everybody, you know? Exactly. And I suppose really in that era, that was where it was just starting to switch from where any type of an artist with Christian faith would have to put out something very obvious. So there was absolutely no question about what their intentions were. That was just where it started to switch and you could become more veiled and have multiple meanings. Yeah, because a lot of labels were pushing for that straight, what they called CCM, like contemporary Christian music, you know, like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that I do know that. 40, yeah, the top 40 of the Christian, you know, you have like your, your DC talk kind of bands, your Sandy Patties or Petras or anything like that, that were super upfront with their message, which was cool. You have to stop so, admitting that you actually listen to Sandy Patty, because otherwise I, I, I just have to stop this call. I didn't say that I technically listened to it. I just said <laughs> I had it. Because like I said, in our house, it was like, my parents were like, they would go to the bookstore and they'd be like, this is what you're going to listen to. And I'd be like, oh no, this is horrible. I like everything from Abba to Zappa, you know, but my forte is more on the heavy side of things. And, you know, I have a lot of friends that play in Christian bands and I love them dearly. And a lot of these bands are really awesome. And then again, you know, there's a lot of bands out there that they're just not my cup of tea and I don't dig them. And I mean, I try to listen to as much stuff as I can that's like uplifting or positive, but just because an album is Christian doesn't mean I'm going to listen to it because, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there and there's a lot of bad stuff. You listen to the radio and you might go, oh, there's like three great songs out of four hours worth of programming. I'm not going to go out and spend all my money on these albums, every album that comes out just because it's Christian because a lot of it I just, you know, I'm not necessarily a fan of. I definitely appreciate what they do. I have so many friends that play in so many great bands like, you know, Living Sacrifice and... uh you know, my friend Jim is the drummer for for Deliverance. There's just so many great bands out there that you can actually enjoy or recommend, you know. Absolutely. Of course, you're coming on to a show that's totally suited to you because the tagline of The Antidote is Christian music that doesn't suck. Yeah, and that's pretty cool, though. I'm sure you get tons of submissions and you have your ear to the ground to see what's out and you know, like, you know, what you like, what you don't like. And, you know, and you, you know, like you hear those albums where you go, Oh my goodness, this is just like, it's so monumental for you. You're like, everybody has to hear this because this is just so amazing. (laughs) You know? (laughs) And tonight we get to reveal clank to the world. (laughs) (laughs) Like if it wasn't for believer, there would be no clank. I used to come home every day and listen to extraction from mortality. And I would play my guitar trying so hard to get those riffs that Kirk Bachman was playing. And for me, it was like, oh, you know, challenge accepted. I'm going to learn to play like this guy. And like, hands down, he's my biggest influence and made me want to be a better guitar player. Just because I, you listen to those albums 30 years later, sonically, um, performance wise and technically, it, those guys were so far ahead of their time and they're still releasing new music. You know, yet another example of a a killer band that's all these years later that still putting out quality stuff.
Another of the classic Clank songs, Wooden Soul from the Still Suffering release. Next up, Clank shares about a special guest he had on one of their songs. On Urban Warfare, you pulled in a superb guest, Doug Pinnock <laughs> of King Zax for the song Something About You. What an incredible guy with an incredible story. But you know what was interesting? At King's X was on the edge of the Christian music scene, but was totally dumped on when Doug revealed that he was gay. That was totally unfair because Doug Pinnock is one of the nicest guys you will ever meet on the face of this planet, hands down. I've known him like 25, 26 years, and he's literally the person that changed my view on gay people. Because like I said, I grew up in a really strict born-again Christian household. They didn't hate gay people, obviously, you know, because they were Christians, but they weren't tolerant of them, and it was very non-supportive, you know, and it was very shunned. And so I had a very distorted and a skewed view of that, you know, like they were bad people. They were horrible. Like, you know, this guy is an amazing guy. And then when he, he told me that he was gay many years ago, it was like, oh, really? Like I was a little taken back at first. And then I was like, you know what? Gay people aren't like scary and bad and like all the things that they were kind of made out to be. And, you know, a lot of people in the Christian industry, they can be very judgmental. I mean, anywhere in life, there's people that are going to agree or disagree. I love Doug very much, and I, it's it kind of sucked to see, you know, the kind of getting raked over the coals he got from a lot of people and getting shunned from it. But you know what? I mean, what a perfect example of a great person. Like, I don't know anybody else that's so loving and so nice. And when we did Urban Warfare, I reached out to him and said, hey, dude, you know, we're we're doing this album and we have a song. You know, would you like to sing? Would you like to be a part of it? And he said, absolutely. So Doug Pinnock spent six days on our couch, dude. So it was like, <laughs> so for me, it was like, that was like having rock and roll royalty staying at your house, you know, and. Dude, this guy cooked insane ribs. And it was funny because I was sitting there get, like working on the grill and he comes over and he like hip checks me and he goes, move over, white boy. Let me show you how it's done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he, he gets on the grill and man, it was it was just awesome. What a great guy and what a blessing it was to have him around. And especially for us, like, you know, my wife and I got to turn him on to like Doctor Who. It was very relaxed, very laid back. And it was really awesome for us because the day he had to leave, you know, we were getting ready to take him to the airport. And he says, you know what? He goes, I really wish I didn't have to leave. He goes, I love you guys so much. And I had so much fun here. And it was so low impact and no pressure, you know, because he's so used to pressure with everything he does. And 20 something year old me is still totally psycho fanboying out that Doug Pinnock's on my couch and cooking me dinner, you know, but at the same <laughs> point, it was like, it was great. I think you should have adopted him. <laughs> oh, if we could have, dude, we totally would have. He's just, he's just so awesome, you know, he's just such a great guy. This is Clank, and you've got the antidote with Dave Hawkins. Don't go anywhere.
If you're unaware of King's X and the great Doug Pinnock, then my friend, it is time to hang up your headphones for good. That was Doug, spelled D-U-G, doing guest vocals on Something About You. If your head has been bobbing to the beat of Clank and you're feeling the urge to start dancing, you aren't the only one. That comes up on the next part of our talk with Clank. The Sound of Clank has been described as dancey, aggressive, electronically infused groove. I mean, that fits perfectly. How many people dance at a Clank show? Um, A lot. Some of it's like moshing and slam dancing, but there's a lot of bouncing around. You know, I mean, it's cool because we've played a lot of places where people just kind of always seem to throw us on a metal bill. So you'll have like death metal and black metal bands and whatever. And then you'll look out like on the crowd and you'll see all these different types of people from, you know, all musical walks of life. And then, you know, you start playing and they kind of look at you, you know, like our intro starts, the fog machine goes, the strobes and the lasers are going. And then you just kind of look at some of these people, like the look on their faces and they're like, what's going on? You know. <laughs> but then by the end of the show, you see people bobbing and, and it's like we always, for the most part, win the audience over and people always come up at the end. They go, you know what, dude? I don't really dig dancey stuff at all, but you guys are not like anybody else. And I really like what you do, and uh, you totally won me over. And so for us, that's like one of the most awesome compliments that you can get. And luckily, we get that like pretty much every show we play. We played some crazy shows where there's people just kind of literally standing there with their arms folded, looking at you with that like inquisitive like, huh, I don't know about this. Like, should I walk out? Should I not walk out? And then... You know, two songs into it, the head's bobbing, you know, and then by the end, they're totally into it. And it's a great feeling for us to be playing and, and seeing, like, literally seeing it happen as you're winning people over. And they're like, you know what? You guys are different, but it's good. It's great for us. Even if it is dancey, I mean, much of your music goes to the dark and rough sides of life. Is this the stuff that you're dealing with personally? A lot of it is. I mean, like, especially if you listen to Rise... The lyrics are a lot of times about like what I'm dealing with and what I'm seeing people around me deal with. And I'm no different than anybody else. I've had my problems with my own demons in the past. And I'm very transparent. I like to write about what I see and feel. And it's like the same thing like when I post online. Like I, from, I try to be open and honest and transparent with people because I like to throw everything out there and say, hey, look, I'm a human being and I'm not going to put up this, you know, fake aura of oh, i'm in a band and my life is great and all i do is make music and i don't have to work a job you know i like to be real and so i tell people hey look this is what i'm struggling with this is how i'm dealing with it and you know a lot of times i just do it basically because if somebody else is going through the same thing hopefully they can like learn from my mistakes and not make the same mistakes or at least get something out of the music you know songs like the damage the last song that song's about like uh, addiction. People suffer from drug abuse, alcohol abuse. I've had my hard partying phases in the past where I was up way too many days at a clip doing things I shouldn't have been doing. But luckily, I mean, I got over all that, you know, and my wife actually played a big role in that. A lot of that, for me, it's it's like autobiographical. Like, like if you listen to the lyrics, it says, you know, um, I know firsthand the damage. I felt it in my veins. I will not make excuses, only myself to blame. It's like, you have to admit you have a problem, you have to own up to it, and I just basically literally put it all out there. A lot of the stuff is just very straight up front. Some people don't see it as positive, but I find it very positive, and I've gotten great feedback from people that said, man, I'm just so glad that you guys are still recording because you you write stuff that touches me inside, and you're just writing music that you're writing as a musician. You know, you write stuff like for me and Pat and Eric, we write stuff that we think sounds cool. You know, like, hey, this sounds good. This sounds good. Let's put these lyrics to it. This sounds good. But when somebody else gets something out of it besides this is a good tune, it's amazing. It's like this weird euphoric feeling that you really can't explain when, you know, it hits people really deep and they relate. And that's one of the things with our listeners our music seems to strike a chord with people. A lot of times it's people who are been oppressed and beaten down and, and they've had really hardships in life. You know, life isn't easy. Life was never guaranteed to be easy and we need to, we deal with everyday issues, but at the end of the day, we're not going to let it hold us down. 
we got to get through. And I'll sit sometimes reading messages from people on Facebook and I'll have like tears streaming down my face. My wife will be like, what's going on? You know, and then I'll, I'll read her this person's message and it's like, it's not about us. It's just how it came across to them. And I'm just happy that we can help people out. You know, when someone comes to you and says, dude, I was going to kill myself, but your music played a big part in me not doing it. And it's like, what do you say to that? You know, like, how do you respond? It's just, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, get, I get super emotional. You know, I can't help it. album rise rise is an emotional release 
you know, especially with the songs that you're describing, like The Beast Within. Yeah. You know, and of course, as you were talking about, too, about being beaten down, because much of Rise gets into how people are beaten down, you know, by others, by society, by themselves. You know, there's the one line that says, most days, it's like another beatdown that we all must endure, like it's someone's twisted game, and they're out to set the score. So is that how the title track came about? Pretty much, pretty much. And that's, like I said, that's the one of the constant themes in clank music, like bring me down, rise. You know, every day we're going to take the beatings and we're going to get back up. You know, we might crawl, we might stumble a little bit and we might be kind of shaken, but, you know, life isn't easy. We're just going to, we're just going to take the hits and, and keep getting up and keep pressing on because that's what we do. That's all we can do. You know, I mean, it's all about perseverance and pressing on. And that's, that's why I said Clank's music has always been positive in that respect. You know, some people don't see it, but, you know, like you get it. Some people go, man, I, I listen to Rise and, ooh, you know, it gives me, you know, goosebumps going over the lyrics and stuff. And I'm like, man, that's that's great because that's what it does for us, you know, like writing it. And it's about real life stuff that people go through. And that's why people are drawn to it because they can relate. When people say describe Clank. I say Clank is where the mosh pit meets the dance floor. Our music is basically like a page from a journal or a diary, but set to music. Sometimes it's like this faucet turns on and you just can't turn it off, you know? And then these the lyrics and stuff come, and I'll usually look to Pat because he's usually like the one sitting there with me. I'm like, hey, what do you think of this? Blah, 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 blah. And he'll just be like, dude, we need to record that right now. Don't forget it. Let's record it right now, you know? <laughs> All of this gets summed up in something you've been quoted as saying about the music of Clank, that it's sonic therapy. Yes, absolutely. It's a lot cheaper than going to a therapist, in my opinion. <laughs> but you know what? I mean, as a human being, like I said before, I struggle with my own things, and I have struggled. I mean, just because someone says they're a Christian or claims Christianity doesn't mean that you are not going to suffer or struggle or deal with, you know, crazy life issues. A lot of times you're going to deal with them more because you're making a conscious choice to try to live a Christ-like life. Like I said, I struggle with things and music has always been my escape. I mean, as a little kid, it was like my parents had their bitter divorce and things were crazy. And that's like the song Leave on Still Suffering. That's about the day my mother left. If you go back and look at those lyrics, it says, you know, um, while holding on to her last kiss, I bid farewell and wave my fist. Because it was literally, my mom said, hey, I got to go. This is over. And I love you guys. And she turned around and she walked out the door. And I remember like that last hug and that last kiss. And then it's that whole like, shaking your fist. And, you know, it's been my therapy because I found peace and comfort in funneling and channeling the, all these feelings through music and the lyrics and to me like i said that sonic therapy is the best way to describe it because i mean otherwise i don't think if if i didn't have music as an outlet <laughs> i'd probably be in an insane asylum or i'd be like on some <laughs> therapist couch you know like they say talking about things is great yeah and but you know what i'm talking about things but i'm talking about things to a wider audience than as opposed to sitting in a therapist's office. And like I said, you know what? If somebody else can get something out of it and it hits them that deep, words really can't do it justice, you know, at least on our end, it can't. I, when people tell me that to my face, I just, I get all like, you know, mushy and I'll end up like hugging them and tell them, dude, I love you, you know? But at the end of the day, it's like, you need to record the music that makes you happy as an artist while being conscientious that people are listening now. Like you have an actual audience.
That was it. The title track off the Clank album, Rise. I've only had time to air just a few of Clank's songs. And now that you're as hooked on the music of Clank as I am, the band has a ton of great music. And you can find all the download links on clanknation.com. I've also only had time to air part of the interview that I had with Clank because he and I both like to talk. You can find that on the Antidote website in the interview section. This week, I happen to meet someone at a show in Barrie who listens to The Antidote. He hears this program as a podcast on iTunes and asked how we can find out what's coming up on our program schedule. You and he can find that out on the sidebar of theantidoteradio.com. I can tell you what's coming up next week, where we go into a split feature. I was blown away by the talent of Peterborough, Ontario newcomer paper shakers and their energetic indie rock anthems then philadelphia's norel kate delivers haunting vocal melodies and acoustic guitar with a powerfully rich sound each of these artists come for a chat about their debut eps clank the man with longevity comes back to share about the disturbing topic of the beast within and i'll close off with that song Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Rise itself, artistically, has had most reviewers claiming that this is your best album. And I know it's obviously, it's hard to step back and critically look at your own work, but would you agree with them? I do, and for us it's awesome because Still Suffering was groundbreaking at the time, and I totally don't want to sound um, egotistical by saying that. I think musically, sonically, and everything, I do believe that this is our strongest release to date. I mean, Still Suffering, obviously, because it's my very first one, will always hold a super dear place in my heart. But I love the way Rise came out. And I know Pat and Eric does, too. And we're just super proud with it. You know, because, I mean, especially as a producer, sonically, this album shines, you know? I mean... When we actually sat back and we listened to the mastered version, we were just like, wow, dude, that's us, you know, (laughs) you know, because at the end of the day, you have to be a fan of your own music, you know, you have to be able to appreciate it. And it's not like, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, once we're done with an album, it's kind of like you really can't listen to it for a while, especially when you're mixing. We'll listen to like rough mixes and demos and pre-production demos over and over and over and over and over and over. I don't even know how many thousands of times I've listened to every song on Rise to the point where it was like once we were like, okay, this is the final master. We're all 100% in agreement. It can't get any better than this. Then it's like, okay, we send it off to manufacturing and it's like you can't even look or think about those songs for a couple of months just because you spend like a year and a half, two years like – so engrossed in it where it's like almost like overkill because you want the product to sound as best as you can and like you know again having your own studio you you listen to every noise every sample i listen to every you know word i uttered and can i do this better this sounds a little flat this is this pat can we fix this let's go in and do this you know after a while you have to draw that line of like okay this is good enough but we were all in agreement and we were just so stoked the way it came out makes you proud you know especially because this album's been so well received and this album has sold really well we put out an anti-suicide video uh for the beast within and it's on clank facebook page and we were just under eleven thousand views in, in just over two weeks which is insane dude and what we did with the video is pay tribute to friends family and loved ones that have been lost to suicide Like I said earlier, they get into this place, this mindset where they feel that's the answer. Um, So we wanted to bring awareness to it. Why don't we memorialize those that we've lost? Because he lost people. Pat lost his best friend that was his old bandmate to suicide. I lost all these people. We worked on this video like for months, man. Because we wanted to tackle the subject, but we wanted to tackle it with love and respect. So basically, you know, Anthony came up with a a storyline about how, you know, this guy, he gets up, he goes to his mailbox and he's got all these past due bills and he thinks his wife is cheating on him and he gets a ticket on his way to work and then he's getting chewed out by his boss. All these things are just compounding and then you see him like he's taking pills, he's drinking. At one point he has a gun and he's going into his yard and he's contemplating suicide and a friend comes to him and just is a friend to him, talks to him and metaphorically talks him off the ledge, so to speak, you know, like 
puts his arm around him and says, hey, man, I'm here for you. I'm here to listen. Let me talk. Let's talk. You know, put away the gun. The video ends with the guy putting the gun down and the guy puts his arm around him and then they walk towards the house. But we made sure at the end we have like all the, you know, contact information for um, the suicide hotline, you know, so at least you can have that interaction with somebody and talk to them and get the help you need or at least that lending ear to help you through the situation and and hopefully you know talk sense into you and re- let you realize that you know it's okay to struggle people do struggle it's part of human nature but you know you don't know what the future has in store for you and it you know suicide is never the answer then would you say that that song the beast within was the most personal for you um pretty much especially after having so many people like i said that were friends you know, I was like 18 and the guy that I grew up with, that my neighbor ended up killing himself. And then after that, like, it just seemed like one after another over the years taking their lives. And it was so sad. And that's why we were like, you know what? People need to know that they're loved and that people are listening, you know, and, and, it, and it, it, it definitely hits home. We took pictures of the people that we knew and I put a post out on Facebook and said, hey, look, we're doing this video, but we're going to do it with love and respect and if you've lost somebody and you want them memorialized in this video please submit a picture to me in the video and um it was very well received i cry every time i sit there with tears in my eyes because i look at all these people like people i've known and loved and all these people who i don't know but i totally feel for there's no worse feeling than losing somebody you love especially to something like that because they felt that there was no other alternative and you know it's powerful it's moving it's it was necessary you know, because people just need to know that, you know, you don't have to, you you know, you're going to struggle and that's fine and normal, but don't take that kind of action. And people need to know, like, if you see somebody and you think that they're struggling, talk to them. Absolutely. Clank, I am so glad that you've been able to come to The Antidote and share about this. Thanks a lot for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for the airtime for Clank. <laughs>